versus uh, uh, functions of axial strain uh, uh, or uh, confining pressure or other things like that. And depending on then what we, you know, then what we do with this model is we try to come up with mathematical models that can mimic that behavior. Okay. And so we're going to start with the first of those today. Uh, but before that, we're going to review more circles. So you probably saw more circles in your solid mechanics class, but we're going to review it today. So um, if I have a body that's under some force, some external forces, and I cut that body, so I'm going to draw this half of the cut over here. And on this cut, I'm going to place a coordinate axis. Now remember, our coordinate axes are sort of arbitrary. We can put them any way that's convenient. And the one we're going to choose here, because it's convenient, is the principal stress axis, a, a set of coordinates that align with the principal directions. Okay. Now, I've drawn them to look very well oriented with my picture, but understand that they, they could be arbitrarily orient, oriented. Wherever the actual principal directions are, that's this axis that's going to be our coordinate axis. Now, of course, because we have forces on this body, right, and we've cut it on a plane, there's going to be some traction vector. This is a stress vector, stress per unit area, right? And the plane itself, like we've done before, will identify with the normal vector. Right? So this is just the normal vector that defines the plane. Right? And then we're going to use some stuff we know, right? So the traction vector which has three components, right? It's a vector, so it has component, we'll call it Tx, Ty, Tz, is equal to, and we have, if you remember, we have an equation that relates the traction vector to the normal vector and the stress tensor, right? It's called Cauchy's stress equation. We you know, sort of we, we use that to derive stress. Here we're we're saying that the body is under stress, and because we've chosen our coordinate axis so special in, in a, such a special way that it aligns with the principal directions, then we in fact in that remember stress is a uh, is a frame and a frame dependent quantity, right? If I go through a rotation, the stress changes, but in this case. I chose the coordinate system to align with the principal directions. Therefore, my stress tensor is a diagonal tensor with is a diagonal matrix with only the quantities of the principal stresses on the diagonal. Right? So there's my stress tensor, and if I dot that into the normal vector, uh, then you know this is my so this is my Cauchy stress equation, right? T sigma dot n. Right? You know, specifically it's transpose, but in this case the transpose doesn't matter. Symmetric. 
So here we, you know, we, we, we know how to do matrix vector products. So if I have a, this vector multiplying that matrix, then I get a vector. And that vector, in this case, is very simple. It's just sigma 1 index, sigma 2, and 1, sigma 3, and z. Now, what would I, what would I do if I want to know the component of the traction vector in the direction of the normal vector? The projection of the traction vector into the direction of the normal vector. Just take the dot product. So uh, I think before we used uh, Sn, right? But in this case, uh, since I'm already using sigma, I'm just going to say, I'm just going to call that sigma n. So sigma n is equal to t dot n, and that's equal to sigma 1 nx plus to and y plus sigma 3 and z squared. So it's just this vector dotted with the components of the normal vector. And now I have this equation. And I'm just, I'm just calling this guy the, the uh, t dot n. I think before we called it s n. Here I'm just calling it. Sigma n. Okay, so that's, w I'm going to call this equation one. Um, likewise, if we, if we wanted to know the, the magnitude of the traction vector, then that's equal to the square root of the sum of the squares is the components, right? So tx squared plus ty squared plus tz squared. Right. It's also equal to since we've since we've defined this as the magnitude of the stress in the normal direction of that plane, there's also got to have to, there, there's also some magnitude of stress in the shear, in magnitude of the shear stress. And so if I, you know, in, in this case, I broke, I broke the traction vector into its, you know, components in the x, y, and z coordinates. But here I want to break it into its components in the normal and shear direction with respect to that plane. And they have to be equal to each other, just by definition. So here I'm going to say this is that. And then I don't like dealing with square root signs, so I'm just going to square this equation. So what I'm calling tau is the shear stress. The magnitude of the shear stress on this surface, on this plane. OK? So then let's, lo let's look at this equation. So now we have the magnitude of this is equal to the components, you know, the addition of the components squared. Here's the components. Those three components are equal to this, right? So this thing is equal to this squared plus that squared plus that squared. 
I'm just using, I know it's a little bit, this thing is kind of in the middle here, but I'm just using the fact that the components are equal to those three things. So then that's equal to that. And so then this thing here, I'm going to call equation two. And then finally, we know that the magnitude of a unit vector must equal to one, right? Just by definition of a unit vector. And so, so then that means that the components nx squared plus ny squared plus nz squared must equal to 1. Just by, again, the magnitude of a vector is the square root of the sum of the squares of its components. So if you can imagine I have a square root sign there. But then I just square both, and it's equal to 1. And then I just square both sides of the equation, where 1 squared is 1. So then I got rid of the square root sign. And this is equation 3. So then if I write equations 1 to 3 in a matrix, have that. Right. And you can just think of this as, you know, A, X, B, right? A, X equal to B. Right. So this is just a matrix equation. A, X equal to B. What's the solution of that equation? So if I, if I don't know, I can just do some matrix al algebra, right? So multiply. Remember what I told you guys? When you're solving matrices, it matters. You know, they, they, when you're doing matrix algebra, you can do the same kind of things you can do in, in normal algebra. That you, if, you know, if you multiply something on both sides of the equation, it doesn't change the equation, right? But the, the, the caveat with matrix algebra is you have to, if you multiply on the left, you have to multiply on the left on both sides of the equation, right? And so if you multiply on the left side uh, this equation by A inverse, right, then A inverse times A is the identity matrix. The identity matrix times a vector is just the vector, right? And so X is just A inverse B. As an aside, you know, we learned row operations when we were Sort of, I was giving you guys a procedure. Essentially, the whole purpose of learning that at the time was so that you had a procedure, a systematic procedure to solve eigenvalue problems, right? Um, but, but knowing tools that you know, do you, do you know um, how you might? Does anyone know you can use row operations to solve the inverse of a matrix? Might. Yeah, how did you know that? You took linear algebra? You did? 
Okay. Yeah. So you would you'd set up a, uh, you know, previously we have you'd have the matrix A augmented with a vector of zeros, right? Here, instead of augmenting with a vector of zeros, you you augment it with an identity matrix of identical size. So if it's a three by three, like it is in this case, you do that, right? And then you would just start your row operations, making this the identity matrix. Just like you know, when we did the row operations, we to when we were looking at linear algebra, we're solving systems of equations. The way we we just did a series of row operations until this became the identity matrix. Well, when you if you do that, if you just do a system of row operations until this becomes the identity matrix, when it's augmented with that, what'll be left here in the end, instead of pre as previously it was the solution to the system of equations. In this case, it'll be the solution to the matrix equations, and in, in this case, it'll be what's left after row operations will be A inverse. So this will be A inverse after row operations. So if you're ever stuck in the desert, you need to invert a matrix, and now you know how. Because I wouldn't expect you to do that you know, if you have a calculator in front of you or, or a computer. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to do that for this problem. However, if we did, the solution would be Looking at the wrong equation. Uh, matrices. Okay. So that's the solution to that matrix equation, 4nx and y and z squared. Now what I'm about to say next is sort of easier to, how do I say this, I guess easier to argue in reverse. In other words, I'm going to make a claim and it's easier to verify that claim than it is to say why I made the claim. It's, it's easier to verify the claim is true than it is to sort of at this moment explain why this, this is true. But basically it has to do with it has to do with the fact that there is, you know, by definition there's an ordering of sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, right? Sigma one is greater than sigma two is greater than sigma three. And some recognition that 
and as we'll see in a second, this, these, there's, there's something special about these equations in that they identify lo loci on a plot, and then those loci are minimized when these components are zero. Right? So it's, again, it's, I'm going to make a claim, and it's easier to verify the claim than it is to explain why. So the claim is that this is always greater than zero, greater than or equal to zero. This is always less than or equal to zero, and this is always greater than or equal to zero. Okay. So if that, if that claim is true, then I can clear the denominators of those equations right, by multiplying both sides. So like, for example, if I uh, now I have an inequality, and if, if I multiply that first equation by the denominator of the first equation, I'm just left with the numerator and greater than or equal to 0. And so, this, so I'm going to clear the denominators of all of them by multiplying through by the denominators on both sides of the equations. And at the same time, I'm going to add something to both sides of the equation. Uh, for example, you know, so um, if this is equation star, for equation star, I'm going to add a term that's like one half and I won't write down, I'm going to write down the final result here, but all of them you're adding a term. You'll, it, you'll see what it is because it ends up on this side of the equation, but you're adding a term that's similar to this to both sides of the equation, right? So it doesn't change the equation. Inequality. Okay. So maybe I'll go to a new page just so it's cleaner. So when, when I do that, then after some manipulations, what I get is this. And this looks kind of messy, but if you were to just say rewrite, call this term x squared, this y squared, and this r squared, then you recognize that this is just a circle where the radius of the circle is on this right-hand side of the inequality. And so what this says is in um, any, for any given values of principal stresses in any particular, you know, cut plane, the, the normal and shear stresses resolved on that plane are going to be light, you're going to be somewhere, you know, for the first equation, they're going to be greater than that circle they're going to be less than this circle, and they're going to be greater than that circle. And what that defines is 
if I were to plot sigma n and tau, and you know, for any um, for any given values of sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. You get three circles defined by the difference, essentially, between sigma one. And so, you know, sigma one minus sigma two gives you the diameter, and then, of course, then the, di the radius is half of that, right? Uh, so it gives you this circle, right, and this circle. But what this says is that the the components resolved on any any surface are always going to be inside inside this region right here. And Here's a little here's a little example I made to try to prove that. Right? So um, there I have the six unique components of a stress tensor. Um, I don't even know. I think they just it looks like I'm just I'm just moving the components to go from uh, it looks like from minus two and a half to two and a half, and those numbers don't mean anything. They could be, you know, because just think of it's normalized, right? The, the components of the stress are normalized so that two and a half becomes a maximum. And I just picked that number because it made a nice plot. I mean, it doesn't really matter. But um, basically, what you'll see is I can move the components of the stress around anywhere. You know, the unique components. And you see, I'm changing the shape. So these circles are, the, you know, plot. Like if I took the eigenvalues of that stress tensor that I'm sort of arbitrarily creating with those slide, slider bars, and plot them in order, and then draw the circles that associated with those guys. Meanwhile, this represents an arbitrary cut plane. The black line is my. Uh, the black line is my normal vector, and the, the two green lines are my resolved normal and shear stresses. And the, and the more circle, the, the black dot represents what those would be. And so the point is, no matter what the, the, the values of the stress are or how I orient the cut of the plane, the black dot can never escape those circles. Uh, not, not, not this morning. I probably could have, but I, uh, I, I did this for a different class a couple of years ago. Yeah. If I had done it this morning, I would have done it in Python. Yeah. I think I already told you guys. I, I, I used to make these in Mathematica because at the time, this was previ previous to the, the Jupyter Notebook having these, these sort of wid widget interfaces uh, that are available now. So. Yeah, so now, and I, I should probably do it one of these days when I'm not teaching two classes at the same time. <laughs> Rewrite this in Python and, and distribute it, uh, uh, you know, via the web like I did that other thing, just so you guys could play with it. But anyway, uh, this is just a little demonstration. It shows that the claim I made is, in fact, true. Um, one more observation bef before we go on. If I go to the lab and I do a tensile test, oh, let me see. Can I go back? So 
you notice I, I've said before that the difference in the maximum and minimum principal stresses is, is a notion of shear, is a notion of the shear stresses, right? And if you look at this plot, you can, so the difference is that guy and that guy, right? So the difference of this, right, defines the diameter of the big circle, right? So half of that would be the, the radius of the big circle. And the maximum shear, right, that's, that, that, that plot is shear. The maximum shear is, is, in the, you know, is at the, the radius of these guys. So if I know the maximum, minimum and maximum principal stresses, then I can define the maximum shear stress. Okay? That's important. That'll become obvious why that's important as I make this next example. If we go to the lab and we test a sample, uh, and we just pull on it with a known stress Y, um, so if, if, if I have a coordinate system that's like this, you know, let's say x1, x2, x3 out of the board, right, then my stress tensor is just going to be y, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. I'm only pulling on it in the 1-1 one, one component in this thought experiment. Okay. Um, imagine I cut this guy and place a coordinate system that's normal to the cut that we'll call x1 prime, x2 prime, x3 prime out of the board. Um, if I want to, just like we had before, let's, let's, you know, so if I, if I draw that coordinate system superimposed on, on this one, this is x1 prime, x2 prime, and let's call this angle between them beta. So if I were then to come up with a rotation matrix for that coordinate transformation, the transformation into from x into the x primed coordinate system, then, and we d we've done this before, so I'm not going to go through the details, but the rotation matrix would be this thing, and of course we know that the stress in the primed coordinate system trans transforms via this equation. And so, and so the stress in the prime coordinate system in the one one direction is it would be equal to y cosine beta, and the stress in the one two that would be the shear stress in the primed would be cosine beta, sine beta. Two sine two beta, and it turns out that this thing here is a maximum at 45 degrees. And the reason this is important is, it's when we go to the lab and we do these tensile tests on specimens, we often see a failure plane. So when, when the sample, in fact, breaks in half, it's often observed that the angle of that failure is about 45 degrees for a vast array of materials, for lots of different materials. And so that seems to suggest that there's something special about 45 degrees, or given this observation, there's something special about the maximum shear stress. And so it seems to suggest that possibly a failure criterion has something to do with the maximum shear stress. Okay. 
and therefore if we go back to these more circles, this gives us a way to, based on the principal stresses, to determine what the maximum shear stress is. And this, again, just is suggestive. I think I'm going to stop in a second. But this is suggestive of a failure criterion that's based on the maximum shear stress. Okay? And we'll come up with that failure criterion by looking at more circles okay, for some different tests. And that's what we'll talk about next time.